So, Carl, if you, if you want to take it away, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah, when I kick it off, we'd like to uh, welcome everyone to our webinar today. Um, for the talk, what we were thinking about doing is having everyone on mute. And as you listen, please feel free to post any questions that you might have in the chat area. And then we'll do questions and answers um, after the presentation. Um, I'll try to be the one to read the questions to Rebecca for her to answer. And just so everyone knows, the webinar is going to be recorded and will be posted to our website afterwards. So if you want to reaccess it, you can. Our topic today is on patient-centered research and design related to CPAP therapy. And in, just in case someone's on who may not be familiar with CPAP, it stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure Therapy and is considered the primary treatment for obstructive sleep apnea. It acts as an air splint to keep the airway open during sleep. And one of the challenges for those who use CPAP therapy is oftentimes the design and the fit of the mask. And if you've ever wondered how manufacturers come up with the sizes they do and the shapes they do and the materials of the masks, this webinar will help you understand how that happens. Uh, the webinar is sponsored by the American Sleep Apnea Association, and the ASA is a patient-led, patient-governed organization. And one of our goals is to help patients understand where they can make a difference. In our webinar today, we have a great example of a company that values the patient's opinions and feedback and incorporates that feedback into what they do and what they make. Um, I personally have had the opportunity to hear several talks by the Fisher PayCal team and how they discuss how they incorporate feed, patient feedback into their design process. And we thought this would be a really interesting topic for our community to learn about. We're fortunate to have Rebecca Thompson from Fisher PayCal live with us all the way from Auckland, New Zealand, where she'll be quite literally talking from the future since it's, what, early afternoon Friday there already. So, <laughs> yep, it is Rebecca. 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday. <laughs> So it's wonderful to have you with us today, and I'll, I'll hand it off to you. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join this webinar. Um, my name is Rebecca Thompson, and I am a clinical research scientist in the Obstructive Sleep Apnea Product Group here at Fisher & Paykel Healthcare in New Zealand. Um, and my role allows me to assist our product development teams with testing new and existing products and clinical trials across the world. So during this webinar, I'll give you a brief overview of how we approach product design and innovation. Um, and I'll give you a brief introduction to who we are as a company first, since a lot of people actually don't know who we are. So at Fisher & Paykel Healthcare, our work is driven by the desire to provide high-quality care to patients. And we can do this by improving care and outcomes through inspired and world-leading healthcare solutions. And this is actually our motto, and this is what we follow every single day. This means that every product we design, every decision we make, and every experience we provide is always about doing what is best for our patients. So where did we start? So Fisher & Paykel wasn't always the large corporation it was today. Um, and in fact, Fisher & Paykel Healthcare was born out of a whiteware company who specialized in importing and manufacturing refrigerators and washing machines. Fisher & Paykel Appliances continues to operate today, but we became a standalone healthcare company in 2001. Um, our involvement in healthcare began in the late 1960s when a prototype humidifier was developed in New Zealand and was designed to be used with patients in intensive care units and hospitals. And this prototype was developed using a standard jam preserving jar. And the original prototype humidifier, which you can see on your screen, is actually still on display in our, in our headquarters in New Zealand. Our very first CPAP was released in 1992. And in 1998, we released the world's first integrated CPAP and humidifier, which has become a hallmark of all of our devices since. Since our humble beginnings, we have grown as a global leader in respiratory and acute care, humidification technology, and obstructive sleep apnea care, and boast over 4,100 employees across the world. And of this, over 2,000 employees are based in our New Zealand headquarters, and roughly a quarter of those spearhead research and development. So we do invest quite a bit of employee time, research, and money into um, research and development here in New Zealand. 
We also have a presence in over 120 countries, so you can pretty much find us um, anywhere across the world. Our vision across the OSA team is very simple. We're always working toward providing therapy that people want to use and that everyone can use. And we really believe that this is achieved through three avenues, through easy interactions, through desirable experiences, and overall effective outcomes. And this vision remains at the core of all product development, from masks to devices to information technologies. Everything that we touch follows this vision. So how do we actually design? Since our vision is very clear, how do we achieve this vision? Where do our ideas come from and where do we actually start? So in order for us to design products, it is very important for us to develop a connection with our patients. While there are some employees who do use CPAP in their daily lives, the majority of us don't live with OSA um, or experience the impact it could have on our lives. The only way for us to understand the journey of patients is by talking with and engaging with you and by putting ourselves in situations that are the hallmarks of your experience. You are the experts. Your experiences, both positive and negative, are invaluable to us. So we want, we want to make your lives easier so the burden of having OSA is lessened rather than amplified. Every opportunity we have to interact with patients is so important, so we try to do this as often as possible. And there are a number of things we have done to try to build this connection and understand your journey. And we try and interact with patients not just in New Zealand and not just in the United States, but all over the world. One of the things we've tried to do is have our developers experience a full sleep study in the lab. We ask technicians to give us the full experience and follow their protocols just as they would if we were a regular patient. And this really truly allows us to understand the sleep study experience firsthand. We often find this experience both incredibly insightful and I'm sure, like most of you, incredibly uncomfortable. So we also have a respiratory therapist complete a full mask fitting and device setup with us. This way, we, the approach, um, this way they approach the fitting on new di newly diagnosed sleep apnea patients the way um, they normally would in the normal practice. Well, while we cannot necessarily simulate what it feels like to receive an OSA diagnosis, we make sure to experience the parts of the journey that we can understand and ask for patients to explain to us their feelings and their emotions and their experiences to gain the full picture. So we, we can all share stories from amazing patients who, have been able to, who we have been able to interact with. Um, we've interacted with patients with those, you know, who feel like CPAP is, is the most awful thing and is the bane of their existence. But we've also interacted with a number of patients who cannot skip one night of, of CPAP therapy and uh, the number of ranges of people that are actually in between this. One of the things we also really like to do is go into patients' homes and observe their normal routines. We can see how they put their masks on, what challenges or issues they might have while they're doing this, but we also try and evaluate whether the issues are design related or are they education related. So is this issue something we can address with design or is it something that can be addressed with more affected, effective and directed education? Are the manuals and user instructions clear enough? Are they too confusing and too wordy? Um, work, do pictures work better than, than simply putting words in a, in a user instruction? Um, some issues we've found while conducting this research are people struggling with twisting headgear, difficulty orienting the mask on their face, um, struggling with clips. We've even seen patients put their masks on upside down. But we do like to observe what patients like about a product as well. Is the silicone on the mask soft enough? Do they like how quiet the mask is? Is the device easy to use? Is it easy to clean? All of these observations get pooled and distributed to the relevant teams who will work together to make a list of requirements for the product. We also observe how patients choose to sleep at home. Where do they put their tubing? What sleeping positions do they prefer? How do they overcome obstacles with their current equipment? We get a glimpse of people's general sleeping routines, the role of their partners and spouses, and what their during the night behaviors are. This particular patient on the slide used a pillow to prop his face on while sleeping on his side. 
He preferred the tubing to go over his head rather than in front of him. And these insights allow us to consider design requirements that address patients' preferences and needs for while they're sleeping. For example, a potential requirement from this observation might be that the mask should be designed to allow the tubing to be put over the head. These are the things that we can only understand through doing this uh, in, the, in the patient home research. One of the most important aspects of product design for both masks and devices is understanding how patients approach cleaning their equipment. What do they struggle with? What cleaning products do they use? What do they wish they could currently do but can't? From our, from our in-home research experiences, the main complaints stem from things like too many parts or headgear tangles or, how, easy or, dis, or, or easy, how difficult or easy it is to disassemble or reassemble equipment. We've heard a number of patients tell us that they don't actually even clean their equipment often because of how difficult it is to take the product apart and put it back together. A common thought is that they'll break the product or will be unable to reassemble the product and therefore might not be able to use it for the night. Equipment can be very expensive, so these concerns are well warranted, and it's our job as designers to make durable and usable products. <clears throat> Excuse me. After all of this research and interaction, a pattern emerged, um, and what we found was that the most successful pa pa patients treated with CPAP therapy, um, they treated this as a part of their daily routine. They integrated it into their lives as they would with doing laundry or washing their hands or brushing their teeth, things that are automatic in our lives. And we really want to tap into what people are good at and play on their individual strengths. So we want to make CPAP therapy easy for you to accommodate into your daily lives when the decision to put on your mask and use your therapy becomes automatic, rather than a choice because it's so easy to fit into your lifestyle. So we've taken inspiration from these things that you do every day and try to put these into our products and make it really easy for you to integrate all of this um, new equipment and thing into your, your regular lifestyle. So next, the design process actually begins. A number of prototypes are developed and put through multiple rounds of testing. From there, any number of changes are made to the prototypes and testing recommences. This process can be short, for example, when testing one component, or they can be very lengthy, particularly when we're testing an entire product. We continue testing prototypes until our feedback meets our expectations um, and our requirements. And these testing cycles may occur with both OSA or non-OSA participants, either in the lab or in the home, and may last anywhere from a single interaction to six months or more of continued use. So this is a very lengthy and time-consuming process. At any given time, we may have more 50 or more clinical and development trials happening across the OSA group. So we're not just concentrating on one product at a time, we're constantly developing multiple things and having multiple things in the pipeline, and each piece and each component needs to be tested, whether that's with patients um, or in our lab through drop testing um, and manufacturing testing. Um, we do testing on every component of the process from start to finish, as well as the product. From a mass development perspective, we also examine anthropometric variations to help us design masks that fit as many faces as possible. Each face is complete, completely different, so examining people's facial structures and nose shapes can help us pinpoint exactly where certain groups of people may have issues using something we have designed. Within, with this information, we're able to actually try and design out flaws. So, for example, Full face mask users tend to complain about feeling discomfort from the pressure on the bridge of the nose. By taking images of people's nose shapes, we can potentially develop uh, solutions that aim to reduce the pressure on the bridge of the nose. We have actually addressed this in our current full face mask and nasal mask range with the Roll Fit Seal, which reduces the pressure on the bridge of the nose by providing an automatic adjustment to each patient's nasal bridge features. Um, so that what this allows the, the patient to do is to um, fit the mask and allow the mask to actually do the adjustment for them rather than doing anything else with reseating um, or figuring out the perfect place to put the mask 
for that one comfortable fit, it automatically adjusts for you. Another problem that we found with nasal pillow masks was uh, nostril irritation from the sta standard nasal prongs. So we've taken lots of images of people's nostril shapes and sizes, and we've tried to develop solutions to specifically address this, this issue. So we came up with our air pillow seal, which um, is found in our current nasal mask, uh, nasal pillows mask. And the, the air pillow seal actually inflates around the nostril rather than using traditional nasal prongs. So when you put the mask on um, and you turn your, the device on, um, the, the pressure from the device actually inflates the seal around the nostril and creates the seal that way, rather than having hard traditional nasal prongs that actually just sit in your nostrils. We're also invested in making our products aesthetically pleasing to all users. So some of the ways we've tried to do this is by listening to what patients actually want. So common themes from patients have included wanting something small, not, not obtrusive, with clean and soft lines, and essentially something that's designed to fit in with the aesthetic of the environment that the equipment is being used in. We've tried our best to make medical equipment not look too much like medical, medical equipment without actually sacrificing the use of the product. We've also focused on improving the ergonomics of our products. Ergonomics focuses on efficiency and interactions of humans with external systems. So for example, we've tried to limit the number of parts on a piece of equipment to a reasonable amount. Um, one way we've done that is with our one-piece seal. So with our seals um, on our masks, the silicone is actually attached to the plastic. Um, so it all comes off in one piece. You can't separate it any further than that, and ma which makes it very easy to clean. We've also extensively tested uh, connection forces to ensure that the connections are made to withstand the pulling of the tube, but also so that the pieces are easy to, to disconnect. So you don't feel like you're struggling to pull a piece apart or put it back together. It's just the right amount of force that allows you to continue using your products um, in, the, in the way you want to, but also in a way that allows you to easily disassemble and reassemble without difficulty. We've also developed structured headgear um, by using uh, special materials to reduce the likelihood of twisting um, while you're trying to orient the mask and, uh, and fit yourself every night. The final stage for us through product development is verification and validation. And this is a rigorous, detailed, and long process. So after we've gone through the full design process, um, we must confirm that we've met all of our requirements before we can obtain uh, registrations and approvals to make the product available in the country. So we call this verification and validation. And these are a bit difficult to, to kind of remember the difference for. We struggle here every day trying to make sure that we get that right. Um, but verification is more of a confirmation that the product has successfully met the product specifications and requirements. So for example, if a device was required to display the time, during the verification process, it would be confirmed that the product could display the time. And validation is where the final product is put through its paces and is tested with real-world use over a period of time. So validation usually occurs in the, in the form of a full-scale clinical trial, where a large number of patients use the product in their homes for an extended period of time. And this validation process confirms that the product performs as expected in the field during um, its intended use. So we can only simulate a certain amount of use in the lab here. Um, so we really um, value putting um, new products with patients in the home and allowing them to use it like they normally would in their daily lives to make sure that we've, we've ticked all of our boxes, but we've made a product that people really like and that, pe that people find acceptable. Our design processes main focus is, is on what the patient needs and what the patient wants, while we're also making sure that we're delivering the appropriate and highest quality care. So our processes have, been, have actually proven quite successful in the, in the most recent years and have resulted in acknowledgement of our state-of-the-art products through design awards from a number of in, international independent bodies. 
So our newest mask, the, the Bravita, has recently been awarded the Red Dot Design Award this year, so we're very excited about that. But it's also a testament to how much time and effort we actually put into designing uh, masks and also developing that connection with our patients to really make a product that people want to use. So we hope to continue this process and gain better understanding of of every patient's journey and learn more as our portfolio grows. So I hope this webinar has provided you with a better understanding of how we conduct product design at Fisher & Pico Healthcare and just how valuable and important you are to us during this process. If you have any questions, um, you can ask them here um, or you can go to our website, www.fphcare.com. Um, or you can contact your usual equipment provider um, and they will um, either get in contact with us or they can help you with any of uh, our equipment. Thanks. Hold on, everyone. I need to unmute a few people. <laughs> Can uh, can folks hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca. That's just a, a wonderful presentation about how far design has come. I remember some of the the early masks and and um, to think about how how far things have come from when they were truly medical devices and bright blue in color and you know and, and now to how you're even thinking about color and how the um, machine is even considered to be more of a, you know, a nighttime clock, for example, is really impressive. A um, couple of questions that have come through on, on the chat um, include, do you have your own sleep lab? So do you have your own internal uh, sleep facility or do, do you do most of the stuff outside? We do. We have a three-bed sleep lab, which is really quite convenient for the very early stages of development when we're not quite ready to um, have patients test. Um, but And it's really handy because it allows our developers to actually spend the night in the lab with the patients and observe what they're doing while they're sleeping. Um, and it's it's really um, a, a, it's a, not a huge facility, but it'll, it, it serves the purpose that we need. Um, but we also do have relationships with a number of labs in New Zealand and in the United States and Canada um, that we do a, a lot of testing with um, outside of our lab. That's great. Another question is, why are the mask tubes so large? So That's a really good the, question. Yeah. That's a really good question. I'm not sure I 100% have the answer for that. Um, Tubing has actually come quite a long way um, in terms of weight and size over the last 15 or so years. Um, it used to be bigger and it used to be much heavier. Um, so we're definitely going in the right direction. Um, and I think that the technology that goes into the tubing kind of forces developers to, to allow for a, an amount of surface area in the tube to keep the pressure constant. So if you have a thinner tube with a higher pressure, the air might be forced um, to an even higher pressure by the time it actually reaches the patient um, in the mask. Um, I think there's some uh, very fancy engineering uh, aerodynamic kind of stuff that um, mm -hmm. kind of dictates how small we can actually make a tube's diameter. Um, mm -hmm. If you also look at um, tubes that have um, a heated coil like our Thoma Smart Tube does, it does make the tube a bit thicker because we've got to account for that heated tube, uh, the, heat, the, the coil that's actually in the tube. Um, but it's definitely something that we've, we've gotten a lot of feedback on, and I'm sure other manufacturers have as well. And it's something that we always try and address um, as we do develop um, tubing in the future is how do we make it as as slim and compact as possible? Sure, yeah. No, because that's one of the things that that patients do do struggle with in in terms of getting wrapped around with it and, and that sort of thing. So that was a good question. <laughs> I yeah. hadn't considered that one before. Yeah. Um, another question is: Are any parts, plastic parts, of the mask itself potentially recyclable? 
because we know that there's um, patients can get re or replace masks sometimes as early as every three months or every six months. So someone just asked about whether or not they're recyclable. Um, that's a really good question as well. Um, I think there are, um, especially I know for our uh, SimPlus and our Eson masks, there's a separate plastic frame that I believe can be recycled. Um, that's something to check with your equipment provider on. They should have that information from us directly. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but that is something that we do think about. I think most of our instructions are just that you can throw everything out in, in your regular trash. But I think it is yeah. also possible to recycle the, the plastic, uh, the fully plastic bits of, of the masks. Right. Okay. And re related to, to that topic, someone just came in with a question about um, the potential for making masks more durable so that they could potentially last longer so we don't have to think about recycling them in three to six months' time. Um, yeah. and, and related to that is – yeah, then the fit so that the, the fit and the seal can last longer, if possible. Absolutely. Um, our masks now have started to be designed where you don't actually have to replace the entire mask every three to six months. You can replace mm -hmm. the components that have worn out um, and actually need replacing. So for the um, for all of our current um, recent masks, the the the, the state of the art ones that are out now, the Simplus, the Eson 2, and the Bravita, um, the seals are removable from the main frame, so that you don't have to actually replace the entire frame. You can just get a new seal, um, or you can just get a new headgear. They're all separated, um, so that you can only you only have to replace the parts that need replacing um, at certain intervals. So you don't have to replace everything all at once all the time. Great. That's really important. Um, let's see. Uh, another question has to do with folks who may have allergies to some components. Um, what, are, yep. what options might they have? Yep. So all of our masks um, undergo bio biocompatibility testing before um, they're released to the market. Um, and we do take into account um, potential for allergies in the materials. So we try and use, um, especially in the silicone area, uh, we try and find uh, versions of silicone that are non-allergenic or hypoallergenic, um, and we're able to um, address that um, with the types of materi materials that we use. Um, it is something that we always think about, and we don't want anybody to have an allergic reaction from one of our products. Um, so that is extensively tested. Um, and as, as new materials get developed um, and new compounds get developed um, that are hypoallergenic and do address um, people with um, allergy issues, that's definitely something that we'll incorporate um, into our products as we go forward. Right. Okay. Uh, another one on cleaning. Are ozone cleaners hard on the mask interface material? Do you find that it potentially... Uh, degrades it or wears them out faster? Um, not necessarily with our masks. Um, I've heard some things uh, across the board of, of other people having issues with, with like the, the SoClean system. Um, but we do try and actually um, work with the SoClean uh, team and have our products validated with them so that we know that they're going to be appropriately cleaned if someone was to have a SoClean um, or an ozone system. Um, so that's something we, we take into account on the front end and, and make sure we do that testing uh, before a product gets released into the market. Great. Um, another topic has to do with the role for um, potentially custom mask fitting. And actually, this is, this is my own question for you. Um, about, gosh, I want to say seven, eight years ago, I heard a talk by a, a Silicon Valley design company. Um, w one of the designers who had sleep apnea and actually took this on himself as, as a project to try to figure out um, a little bit about, about mask design and, and mask fitting. And what I remember him saying at the time was that um, there was potentially not a need for custom masks. In, in terms of like you know getting a custom fit and and a, and a individualized uh, mask for for oneself, 
because the design process resulted in um, masks on the market that generally fit somewhere between 95 and 98 percent of all faces. And when you showed that screen yeah. with the anthropo anthropometric measurements and we saw the, you know, the 100 or 200 different faces on there, I, I thought that should be a good question and to see what you guys might have found. Um, so, yeah, anything you can say on that topic would be super interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's actually a number of companies that are exploring this as a, as a potential avenue in, in offering mm -hmm. custom-made masks. Um, there's, there's a couple of flaws in the system when it comes to custom masks. Um, custom always sounds great because it's it's exactly for you and and that's that's great to a point. Um, the pro uh, what we see as the problem with custom made masks is from a from a design perspective. Once we actually get the design of a mask, we have to actually order the equipment to produce that um, that equipment, um, and that equipment can cost millions of dollars. Um, and to make an individual mold every time you had one mask that you needed to make custom for somebody costs extra for the manufacturer. So what that's going to do in turn is going to increase the price of the mask to a, a, an astronomical level. Um, so in order for us to actually provide equipment that's affordable to a patient um, and affordable to the market, we actually it's, it's better if we can address as many faces and fit as many faces as possible with the sizing that we have. Uh, with this, with the small, extra small, medium, large, extra large type system, because it makes the equipment no less usable but much more affordable. Um, so it's still high quality, um, amazing products, but you can, uh, you can, they're affordable, and, and insurance will cover that. Um, whereas uh, custom made masks require a lot more overhead from a manufacturer. Um, so it becomes really challenging. Um, plus, the manufacturer then has to store all of those molds somewhere and wait for that reorder to come in when the patient needs a new mask. So they potentially could have millions of, of molds that are only designed for one specific person. And it doesn't necessarily become practical for a manufacturer. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily know if it's something that we'll see a lot of in the, in the future. I think there'll be some. Um, but I think the best approach is to find masks that fit most. Um, if we can get to 95, 98% of people, I think we're doing really well. Um, we're never going to be able to fit absolutely everybody, but that's why we have you know, a number of manufacturers because if we don't make a mask that fits you, there's likely to be somebody else who makes a mask that does. Right. And I think that's one of the important things is, is trial and error. And I think some of the most Absolutely. motivated patients are, are ones who do engage in trial and error and, and don't stop until they get that, that mask shape and, and size that, that work for them. Absolutely. Great. Um, let's see. There was a question from Amy on the chat. It says, is there a plan to add BiPAP and modems to the machines? Those are very good questions. Um, we are considering all of the options that we currently don't offer in our suite of masks or our devices. Um, these are things that um, get brought up quite often. Um, so it's, it, it will be a wait and see exercise um, for you guys, unfortunately. Um, but I, I believe that as we move forward, we will address all of the gaps that we currently have um, in the market. Um, and I think you'll all be very, very excited about what we've got coming down the pipeline. Great. And another question is on um, pediatric masks and yep. F and P, and whether you have either in the pipeline or what do you have going in? Um, we actually do have a neonatal division that um, produces. Um, equipment for uh, newborn babies. Um, so that is something we do have some experience in. Um, they're actually separate to our OSA product group, so they're in their own separate division. Um, and they do provide um, equipment for neonates, um, and they do provide some equipment for um, babies who are born with OSA. Um, but we don't actually have any plans to jump into the pediatric space at this point. 
Um, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, never say never. Um, sure. It's always something that we'll consider. But um, at this point, all of our products um, across uh, Fisher and Paykel Healthcare are for adult use only and by prescription. Right. I don't know, and you, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. I wonder if the pediatrics has to do with the size of the business, because I know as we look in the United States anyway, I, we really, as an organization, we believe that there's not enough pediatric sleep doctors out there for the potential Absolutely. size of the kids with problems. So I think it's a very slowly growing business. So Definitely. We, um, and yeah. Yeah, there's definitely an opportunity to bring more awareness to that group as well, um, especially with the obesity numbers in the United States particularly on the rise, unfortunately. Um, we do need to make people aware that this could be an issue um, in their children and to get it checked out if they, if they feel like their child portrays any of the symptoms of OSA. Um, but I think that uh, it's definitely an opportunity to to bring more awareness and to, to talk more about it and bring it to the forefront of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely something that the ASA is going to get, get behind even stronger than we are now. Awesome. Okay. Another question. I'm the only one that wears my mask so as to not share germs. Why, it is, why is it important then to clean masks as directed? Um, cleaning is really important, not just from a germ perspective, um, but for, for your own benefit as well. So masks that don't get cleaned very often could potentially grow mold um, through because we're using humidification or water through a system, um, as well as you know your breathing in your mask, which could leave um, uh, liquid residue in your mask. Um, it's constantly touching your face. We all sweat at night. Um, so people who um, don't actually wash their masks often enough can maybe break out. It also, ex it cleaning, uh, having a good cleaning routine actually extends the life of your mask as well since the materials that are touching your face are actually broken down a lot faster by um, residual oils and, and sweat from our skin. Um, so it's actually not just about kind of a germ thing. It's, it's more about making sure your equipment lasts for as long as possible, um, but also mm -hmm. making sure that um, you're keeping yourself um, in a sanitary way, in a, in a hygienic way. Um, and making sure that everything is clean and, and ready for you to use. Great. Another question is, what do I do when the air goes into my eyes? That's, you know, that's a common complaint that some people have um, with leak from around the, the bridge area. Yep, so um, if you do find that your mask is leaking from around, around your eyes and into your eye, the best thing to, to do first is to reseat your mask. And what I mean by that is pulling it slightly off of your face and kind of jiggling it around a little bit and putting it in, in a better spot. Um, that usually will help um, any air leaks that you've got, not just ones that go into your eye, um, but also ones that uh, may be from the side of your mouth or um, around your nose. Um, and if that doesn't work or you're constantly getting leaks, I would go straight to your equipment provider. It couldn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that your mask doesn't fit. It could just mean that you're, you need a new seal, um, or you need a new headgear or something isn't quite right and you're due for new supplies. Um, so I would try the reseating technique and see if you can get a better fit. Um, and if you can't, go straight to your equipment provider and ask for, um, some, some new supplies. Great, thank you. Rebecca, another, um, this is another one of my questions, is um, when, when we see new patients get set up, I mean, oftentimes when, when they come in, they're, they're pretty tired. And I've done a lot of research in this area where we might have a talk with them for you know, 15, 20 minutes, and then it's another 20 minutes to review the um, CPAP machine itself, do the setup, pick a mask, try it on. And they just, there's just no way to, to absorb all the information that, that's coming their way. Um, you had mentioned the importance of, of patient instructions. I was wondering, since you're, you guys are doing such a great job on the design aspects, if you're trying to innovate on providing patients with instructions at all. And the only other thing I would say is when one of my early 
research projects, I had a really motivated graduate student who made little interactive. She actually broke down all the parts of a mask when there was a lot more parts to a mask than there are now and made this really neat interactive because sometimes back in the day when people would undo their mask, they would say, how do I put it back together? <laughs> yeah. They'd have 12 pe That's pieces so in front of them. So what kinds of things yeah. are you doing to help improve patient instruction? Um, we actually put our instructions in front of patients and actually use them for clinical trial. So we do a full mm -hmm. usability evaluation on a mask or a device and give them a list of instructions with the user guide and say, use the user guide to follow these instructions and perform these tasks. If any of those tasks fail, we haven't written the instruction clear enough, we'll rewrite it and test it again. Um, so we do the same thing with all of our manuals um, and all of our, um, our, our quick guides um, to make sure that we're actually telling people what to do in, in, in an effective way. Um, and you're right, there's, there's a lot of information that comes at you, especially in that first initial setup visit, you're getting a lot of equipment, it's all overwhelming, it's all very new. Um, and from experience, I've found that taking it in stages has been quite helpful. I, ca I actually came out of uh, the U.S. working for a sleep clinic um, in their research department, and one of my jobs was actually setting up brand new patients. And I found that giving them bits of information and then telling them to go home and use it and then come back and see me in a week um, and then going over something a little bit more complex actually really helped them gain confidence in using their, their equipment. Um, and they relied a lot less on the instructions from the manufacturer and really relied on me, which was quite nice, um, mm. and used me as a source of information. So I think that taking a staged approach is, is can be really helpful in, in reducing that, that, that feeling of overwhelming that, that can occur in these very long and, and tiring visits. That's great to hear. Yeah, I think that's so important, especially over time. I mean, I've always considered getting patients started as a several day or even a week or two process. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Yep. Um, Let's see, there's another question in chat. Will there be or is there an oral appliance offered, um, possibly some type of hybrid mask? Um, we have a oral mask called the Oracle. Um, it has been around for a very long time, um, and we're not actively updating it at this point, but it is uh, a great mask for the people that love it and use it. Um, we we have a number of patients that actually order them in at t 10 at a time because they're just so afraid that they're not going to be able to get it anymore. Um, so it, basically what it is is it kind of functions like an oral appliance, but it still delivers pressure. Um, but it doesn't sit on the nose or it doesn't sit on the face. It just sits in the mouth. Um, you can see the Oracle on our website if you've got any um, questions or concerns about what it looks like um, and how it works. Um, but it's, we've, we've done a lot of testing with it, and it's just as effective as a nasal mask. So you're going to receive the same therapy, but it might not be as, as, um, as on your face and, and potentially annoying as, um, as other masks can be. Um, we are the only manufacturer that offers an oral mask at this point. Um, so if, you're, if that's an option that you want to explore, um, you can go to your equipment provider or go to our website and learn a bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Great. I don't see any other questions coming through. Um, I did want to ask one more on, on lifestyle because I think that's just so important. Um, in my training is behavioral um, sleep medicine, and, and so um, I oftentimes look at the use of um, CPAP as, as really an action that, that someone has to take. And, and so with, with the approach that you guys are, are taking in terms of incorporating it into the patient's bedtime routine, what, can you speak a little bit more about that and some of the things you've learned about um, what works and, and what doesn't work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've learned a lot from patients that they – they don't want to use something that doesn't fit into what they normally do, that puts them too far out of their routine, um, that makes it some... I mean, having OSA and, and experiencing the burden of OSA is, is important enough to understand, but then you add this completely left-field, kind of scary 
um, piece of equipment into the equation that you now have to use at night in the in the most sensitive part of your house in your bedroom, um, and you've got your kids that could see you, you got your your wife or your husband that could see you, your your partner. Um, it's it's a very sensitive environment. So for us, we want to make sure that when somebody walks into your bedroom, if you're doing a house tour, you've just moved into this great house and you've got your CPAP on your side table, you know, we don't want people to, to point at that and say, oh, what's that? We want it to fit in with the environment that that is in your life um, and is in your house. We don't want something to stand out that's, that overtly says, I've got something wrong with me, ask me about it. Um, mm -hmm. Although I'm sure some people are like that. Um, mm -hmm. But... But for us, we want to make it as seamless as possible, um, and we really understand that it, it's it's so hard to integrate this new piece of equipment into your into your daily routines and into your lifestyle. So for us, from a design perspective, we want to make sure it looks and feels like it's supposed to be part of the bedroom environment and not something that's that's a piece of medical equipment. Right. That's great. Okay, um, I think there's one last one, and that is um, to, to ask about small travel devices and your thoughts on them and what F and P might be doing um, with with those. Yep. Um, so this is definitely um, coming into the forefront. We've got lots of new travel devices that are coming onto the market, which is awesome. Um, it's something that we are looking at from a development perspective. Um, it is something that is very challenging to design. Um, machines now and devices are much smaller than they've ever been, um, but it's still quite challenging to get all of the technology and all of the equipment into a very compact travel um, travel size piece of equipment um, without sacrificing anything. And that's really what we want to be able to do. If we're going to put out a, a, a travel device at some point, potentially, um, we need to make sure that it still matches who we are as a company um, and what we stand for and the technology that we offer. So finding a way to do that um, is probably going to be the most challenging bit for us should we get into that space. Um, but it is something that's becoming uh, quite popular and, and necessary, I believe. Um, it's just very challenging to get all of that in one one thing and have it be at a price that makes sense as as a secondary mm -hmm. CPAP, um, since most insurances probably wouldn't cover a, a travel CPAP um, as a secondary device. So we've got to make it so that it, it works, it's high quality, um, it's providing effective treatment, um, has all the technologies that you would want in your normal device, but still be at a price that's incredibly affordable. So it's it's something that we'll be developing over time, I think, not just with us, but with all of our, all of the manufacturers across the world. And I think as we go on, travel devices will, will only get better. So it's definitely a positive area. Great. Well, Rebecca, this has been wonderful. Um, thank you so much for doing this. And I guess the one last question is if, if the patient community has feedback, should they go directly to you or go to us and we go to you? <laughs> Um, that's a good question. Um, they can go to either. Um, so okay. you can either they can have a have a chat with you, um, or they can go to their equipment provider and, and pass feedback on to our reps. Um, our mm. our reps are where they're everywhere. Um, you can find them pretty much everywhere, um, and they always are constantly feeding us back information. Um, we can't be everywhere all at once, so that we rely on them as our eyes and ears. Um, so if you ever have any feedback or ever have any questions, you can talk to us directly through our website or through the, the ASAA um, or through your equipment provider and our sales rep. So you've got lots of options. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, and thank you for everyone that listened today and posted questions. We hope we answered everyone's questions, and uh, I think that will we'll wrap up there. Thank you, everybody. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Rebecca.